So I'm going to be talking about improving performance on your website with responsive and responsible images. Um, don't, don't tell the organizers, but this is not actually a CSS talk. It's mostly about HTML. I'm not quite sure how I snuck in, but if we can keep it a secret, that would be great. Um, so I'm Dave Newton. Uh, I work at Shopify, as apparently everybody talking today does. Um, so I live in Toronto, and I've been at Shopify for about six months. It's an awesome place to work. In addition to working at Shopify, I have since uh, December 2012 worked online with the uh, W3C's Responsive Images Community Group. Um, it's actually now the Responsive Issues Community Group because we're branching out into other things. But it started with all images all the time. And uh, this is a group that got together to try to come up with a standard solution for how to deal with responsive images on the web. This is where you can find me online. I'm at Neutron on Twitter, at NWTN on GitHub, and the slides are available at this URL. So uh, let's talk a little bit about web performance in general. This is a quote uh, from Chris Zacharias. He put this uh, post up, a short little article called Page Weight Matters. Um, Chris worked at YouTube and they noticed that the video player page, besides the video itself, weighed about 1.2 megs and was taking a long time to consume. There was also about a billion requests on the page, so it was really taking a long time to render. So uh, Chris started this project called Feather that was designed to reduce that page uh, weight and the number of requests in order to improve render time. So they did that and they got it down to about 100 kilobytes and just a few requests, again, not counting the video itself. Uh, and what they found was that the page, average page render time actually went way up instead of way down. And that's really counterintuitive. You would expect that dropping over a meg of uh, assets and, and dropping the number of requests would help your performance. Um, and then eventually somebody started looking at the data more closely and noticed that geography came into play. And what happened was before the Feather project, there were people in uh, developing countries or on mobile networks that weren't able to load the page at all and they would give up because it would take 20 minutes just to get the page to render. But now that Feather was in place, they were able to load the page. It was still slow, it took maybe two minutes because it was a slow connection, but they actually had access to the content and that caused the average render time to go up. But they were opening this content up to whole new markets and people who were never able to access it before, which is kind of cool. Uh, I think a little anecdote like that is a nice way to introduce people to performance. But if you're definitely, or if you're more of a stats person, uh, I would encourage you to check out wpostats.com. It talks about how improving performance can increase sales and conversions and all sorts of stuff like that if you really need to make a business case for it. Um, but it's not always just about a business case. It's important to remember, as Brad, Fr Brad Frost said, that good performance is good design. It doesn't really matter what your content is or what it looks like if people are leaving before it ever actually loads. We want to deliver an amazing experience to every user, no matter who they are, no matter where they are, or how they're accessing the site. So with that super brief intro to performance as a whole, why should you care about images specifically? There's lots of things that affect performance. We've had images on the web for almost 23 years now, basically unchanged since this initial proposal from Mark Andreessen. It's uh, kind of shocking how stable images have been up until now. So why do we need this whole new responsive image stuff at this point? It's because of this. This is uh, the latest data from the HTTP archive about the average web page, the average size of the average web page, which is now about 2.2 megabytes. And 1.4 megs of that, or about two thirds, comes from images. So images are this huge problem that we have. They're contributing a huge amount of weight to our pages. And this is gonna be painful to consume on, say, a mobile network or even a conference Wi-Fi or hotel Wi-Fi, although this conference has been pretty good. I'm not going to knock the Wi-Fi here. Um, but anyway, two megs is a lot, and 1.4 megs of images is a lot. And it's not standing still either. This is a graph also from HTTP Archive, 
with five years of data from November 15, 2010 till November 15, 2015, showing uh, in red the number of image requests that are made on the average web page. And that's stayed pretty consistent in the mid-50s. Seems kind of high to me, but it's, a, it's an average. Um, and then the more shocking part is the blue line, which is the transfer size in kilobytes rising over time from about 415K in 2010 to now almost 1.4 megs. So this is just going up and up and up and it's causing problems. Um, people have fast connections though, right? They have cheap broadband and who cares if there's a lot of images. Well, not everybody has broadband. A lot of people use mobile phones. And even in 2010, which was the beginning of that graph, uh, there is this stat that the New York Times reported that more human beings had access to a cell phone than a toilet. So as the uh, page weight increased and the image weight increased, we're seeing a big explosion in mobile. Everybody is on mobile phones. Um, outside the US and even outside of major metropolitan centers in the US, Sometimes you're going to have a slow connection. It's not always going to be a 4G LTE connection. You're going to get dropped connections and assets that don't load quickly. Um, we're at a point right now where for many people, uh, it's a little hard to see on here, but 64% of Americans own a smartphone and have used a smartphone to access the internet. Um, but in 2013, Pew Research reported that 34% of Americans used a phone as their primary or only way to access the internet. So we have a lot of people on mobile connections. This is an illustration from OpenSignal showing that mobile, although it's a convenient category and a convenient label, isn't a single target. This is over 18,000 Android devices that were available as of August 2014. So when we talk about mobile, we have to realize that we're not targeting one single thing. We're looking at how uh, these images are loading on a variety of devices. So we're in this situation where we're serving huge giant images to everybody, regardless of their context, regardless of the device they're using, and often over really terrible connections. Why are we doing this? Well, the reason we're doing this is because we had this problem. If you're a designer or even if you're a developer, you want your images on your site to look nice and crisp. And you, the way we do that is with this little bit of CSS. When Ethan Marcotte first started talking about responsive design, this is how he recommended uh, serving your images. You throw a big enough image at the browser, and give it a max width 100%, the browser will scale it down, keep the aspect ratio, and everything's gonna look beautiful no matter what the display is. It handles different size displays. It handles images in different layouts showing up at different sizes. And it handles screens with different uh, pixel densities or DPRs, device pixel resolution. I'll probably say that a few times. Um, so our solution to that problem was serve one big image and let the browser scale it. And as long as that image is big enough, it's gonna look great. But then stuff like this comes along. This is a Retina iMac which is 5,120 pixels wide. So let's say you have a restaurant website and uh, I know restaurant websites love huge giant images of salad because nobody knows what salad looks like so they better damn well show you that their salad looks delicious. Um, so if you're building this restaurant site, you might throw up an eight megabyte, 5,000 pixel wide JPEG as your hero image so it looks great on your next door neighbor's retina iMac. Cool, right? It's gonna work for everyone. A browser will just scale it down if they have a smaller screen, whatever. But if I'm out around town looking for something to eat, trying to look up your restaurant's website, I might not have a connection where an eight megabyte photo of a salad is appealing to me. I took this screenshot when I was in Paris uh, with my wife for our anniversary and we were looking for a place to eat. And everywhere we went, there was this stupid E up in the corner of my screen, we had an edge connection all over the city. And Paris is like a big metropolitan center. You'd think there'd be great fast internet everywhere, but there wasn't. And so when we tried to go to these restaurant websites, they wouldn't load. And it was a situation where these businesses literally lost out on our business, on our money, because of a poorly performing website. So there's like real implications here when you have a slow site. To you, there's real implications to your user and to your business. 
So besides annoying your users and costing you money, it's also potentially costing your users money. Uh, this is a site by a guy named Tim Cadleck. It's called uh, whatdoesmysitecost.com. And it's actually really cool. You can put in a URL and it looks at data rates from all over the world and the size of the site that you just entered. And it tells you how much it costs to load your web page. So I put in vogue.com because uh, whatever. <laughs> and it was almost eight megabytes. And I learned that if I was in the nation of Vanuatu, it would cost me over $2.50 just to load the Vogue homepage, which is crazy. Like, how can we expect this of our users? Now, maybe you're not tar targeting people in Vanuatu, but data caps are a real thing everywhere, and data costs are a real thing everywhere. I know I've definitely experienced it firsthand where I have a mobile data cap and I'll be two weeks into my plan and start getting overage charges and it pisses me off because I'm not doing anything crazy, I swear, other than like maybe occasionally looking for dinner. And so, so there's like real world effects that poorly performing sites can have. So all that stuff I just talked about was about file size. Um, but it's also important to remember that having more pixels in your image can have other effects too. Uh, a larger image is going to consume more energy, drain your battery faster. Uh, it's going to take longer to decode, which means longer to render in the browser. It's going to use more memory, which means you can have fewer apps open, or maybe it won't work at all on an older device where memory is at a premium. Um, so this was our problem. We want images to look good for everybody. But we actually have a harder problem to solve than that. We want images to look good for everyone, but we'd want to do it without hurting the user experience. And that's where responsive images come in. So whereas before we had the solution, serve one big image and let the browser scale it, we can now come up with a better solution, which is to serve an appropriate image to every user. And this fits along with sort of the philosophy of responsive design as a whole, where we're talking about serving an appropriate layout or an appropriate experience to each user based on their context. So responsive images are just the same thing, but hyper-focused on images. Um, if this is going to be our solution, we need to define what appropriate means. So let's talk about use cases. I've already covered three of them. There's five I want to talk about. So the first one is just different screen sizes, pretty basic. The next is images rendering at different sizes because of the layout. The next is different screen resolutions. And then one other one is file types. So uh, some browsers, like Chrome and Opera, I think support the WebP file type, uh, but other browsers don't. And WebP is really cool because at the same subjective visual quality as a JPEG, it's going to have a smaller file size, which means if your browser can support it, it's a cool idea to deliver it because you'll save bytes and have faster page rendering and stuff. So figuring out a way to serve this when it's supported is one of the use cases. And then the last one is called art direction. So this is Obama's dog, Bo, sitting on the lawn in the White House. And what art direction is, is um, like how these images are cropped differently depending on the device. So because Bo is the focus, we want to make sure that his face is vi visible in all these different contexts. On the desktop, there's tons of space, his face is visible, but we can also show the White House and the lawn and stuff. But as you get onto smaller screens and down to mobile, if we kept the cropping the same, Bo's face would be tiny and impossible to see. So we crop differently, and that's art direction. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning that I was maybe at the wrong conference because this is an HTML talk. This might just get me into a little more trouble. Uh, solving this problem with CSS is a bad idea. And there's a few reasons for that. The most important reason is because of this thing called the preloader. And the, the preloader has been called the single biggest performance improvement in browser history. What it is is, uh, okay, so you load a web page and there's certain things called blocking resources, which are like JavaScript and some CSS, where the rendering of the page has to stop until the browser downloads and parses and sometimes executes those things. What the preloader does is when it hits a blocking resource, it just kind of keeps going while that stuff's happening and looks for images that it can download and downloads those in parallel so that by the time all the blocking resources are ready, it has an image sitting there ready to go and ready to render. 
if we put uh, our images in CSS and do responsive images in CSS, we can't take advantage of the preloader. Um, the browser would have to download the CSS, parse the CSS and everything before it would even realize that an image needs to be there. So that's the biggest reason why CSS is not a good solution for this. Additionally, CSS uh, background images are for styling our content for decorative purposes. And really what we're talking about with responsive images is usually content images. So with CSS, you can't have alt text, which means if the image doesn't render for some reason, you don't get alternative text. If your users are using assistive technology, like a screen reader, they won't get any information. And it won't be indexed the same way by a search engine. Using JavaScript is also a bad idea for similar reasons. You completely throw out the preloader, and it's gonna fail in contexts where JavaScript is not available, which means if somebody turns off JavaScript, which is unusual, but happens, or more commonly, if there's like a third-party script from an ad that breaks everything in your page, or if the user has a plugin installed that breaks the JavaScript in your page, you'll end up with no images. Um, so CSS and JavaScript are not great solutions for this, which is why uh, some people got together a few years ago and tried to come up with a markup solution this is the result, this is the responsive images specification. Um, it took a few years, but we're finally here. And so let's dive into it and look at what the markup actually looks like. So uh, I'll go through each use case. The first one I'll look at is resolution switching when your device has different pixel densities. So this is the normal image element that we're used to. You have uh, image and then a source and an alt. And this is what it looks like as a responsive image. So you start with the exact same source and alt attributes, but now you add this new attribute called source set. And source set is a comma separated lists, uh, list of files, of sources, that are possibilities for the browser to choose from. And next to each one, you have this little thing called an X descriptor. And the X descriptor tells the browser what pixel density you're targeting with each image. So if I'm on a MacBook Air with a 1x display, the browser will know that the display is 1x. It'll see that wolf600.jpg has a 1x descriptor, and it'll download and display wolf600.jpg. If I'm on a MacBook Pro with a 2x display, it'll download wolf1200.jpg. Wolf and then if the browser doesn't understand source set, or there's no appropriate source listed there, it'll just fall back to what's in the source. Now, because we're serving uh, responsive images with source set here, we can probably get away with not serving the huge gigantic image in the source. We could probably cut that down to the 600 pixel wide one, and then in browsers where it falls back, you're getting a pretty decent experience without a huge performance hit. So that's it for resolution switching. Um, one more important piece of information to remember is that source set is actually a recommendation to the browser. You're giving it these pieces of information. Here's my file list, here's the densities, but it's ultimately the one making the final decision about what to display. And I'll talk about that a little bit uh, again later. So viewport switching, which is, oh yeah. Uh, it's just pointing to the actual like location on the in the directory like No, yeah, it doesn't care what the path is or the file name or anything like that Yep uh, So let's talk about viewport switching which is uh, changing out images based on the size of the viewport or window or device size so again you start with your normal image and This is what it looks like if you're doing viewport switching so source and alt as usual and now we have this new attribute called sizes. Uh, sizes tells the browser what size the image is going to be displayed at, approximately. You can fudge it a little bit if you want. Um, does everybody know what a VW unit is? Are you familiar with that? No, okay. So VW is a CSS unit me that means viewport width. So it just means 100% the width of the viewport without regard to like the size of the parent or anything. So you would, make something 100 VW if you wanted to, to stretch across the whole screen or be the size of the whole screen. And you can use that elsewhere in CSS as well. Um, so that's what this is saying. Sizes equals 100 VW is 
saying that you want the image to render the size of the whole window. Um, actually, let me go back to this for a sec. It's important that we have to give this hint here because remember the preloader is going through the page and getting to this information in the markup before any CSS has been rendered or downloaded or parsed and before the image has been chosen, let alone downloaded. So the browser has no idea how big it's gonna display based on your layout and CSS and it has no idea how big the image is inherently. So it can't make a decision unless you give it this little bit of hint about how big the image will eventually be displayed. Next we have the source set attribute and now instead of an X descriptor, we have this W descriptor where you're saying how big each of these files is. So wolf300.jpg is 300 pixels wide, wolf600.jpg is 600 pixels wide, and so on. And now the browser is able to say, okay, I know how big you want it displayed. I know how big each of these files is. I'm able to take those two things together and figure out what the most appropriate image to download is. If I'm again on a MacBook Air and my window is 600 pixels wide, then the browser will download wolf600.jpg because it's 600 pixels wide. It's a good match for my 100 VW size. If I'm on a MacBook Pro that's a 2x resolution, the browser will download wolf1200.jpg because it knows that the browser window is 600 pixels wide, the resolution is 2x, so to get a nice crisp image there, it'll get the 1200 that'll fill up that 600 pixels but at a 2x density. Does that make sense to everyone? So you can actually put any CSS or almost any CSS size into the sizes attribute. You could put just a straight pixel value if you wanted and then depending on, uh, it, it would download a resource basically just depending on the DPR. You could also do something like this, throw in CSS calc where say you want it to be 100% the width of the viewport but you have some padding on either side so you subtract that. The browser will do that calculation, take in the DPR into account, and pick the most appropriate file size. So you don't have to worry about doing any of that math. The only thing you can't put in is a percent value. And that's because, again, the browser hasn't downloaded or parsed the CSS yet. It doesn't know what the layout is. It has no idea what size the parent is. So it won't be able to use that information to pick a resource from source set. Now that helps us if we're looking at window size or device size, but what about something like this where our image is displaying at different sizes based on a responsive layout, which is a pretty common scenario. In the first one, they're about the third, the width of the window, and the second, they're about half, and in the last one, they're about full width, more or less. Well, we can do something like this. We can put a comma separated list into sizes and for each one, give a media condition. So we can tell the browser, if we have a min width of 1,000 pics, the image will display at 33 VW. If we have a min width of 600, it'll display at 50 VW. Otherwise, it'll display at full width. So this lets us pair our responsive image that gets downloaded with whatever layout we're specifying in our CSS, even before that CSS has been downloaded and parsed. So that's resolution, or no, viewport switching and resolution switching all combined into one. Uh, let's quickly talk about file type switching. So again, normal image. Now we have this picture element. So we have our normal image tag, no extra attributes or anything here, but now it's a child of this picture element. And in addition to image, uh, which is a mandatory child of picture, you can't do picture without having an image child. Uh, we have this new source uh, element. It's actually not that new. If you've ever used HTML5 video or audio, you're probably familiar with uh, source and having a list of children's sources to choose from. So in this case, we have a type attribute on source where we tell the browser this file is a WebP image. You just put in the MIME type and if the browser understands how to deal with WebPs, it'll download that and display that. If it doesn't, it'll just fall back to this JPEG. And unlike source set, uh, a source is an imperative to the browser. We're telling the browser, you definitely have to pick the first source you understand. So you won't get into a case where the browser decides, ah, I feel like downloading JPEG today. Not gonna happen. Uh, that's gonna be a little bit imp more important when we come to art direction. So you can put more than one source in there too. Uh, when, or Internet Explorer and I guess Edge 
supports this format called JPEG XR, which is a lot like JPEG, but has a little bit better performance. But it's not supported anywhere else, so nobody uses it. But now that we have picture, you can throw it in there. You can say, if you understand WebP, go for that. If you don't, but you understand JPEG XR, do that. Otherwise, regular old JPEG. And again, because of the way this is set up, if you're on an older browser that doesn't know what picture is and doesn't know how to deal with these sources, it's just going to render what's in the normal image tag because it's just a plain old image tag. So you get a built-in fallback. Last use case is art direction. Uh, up until now, my alts have all said a rad wolf. It's now time to meet the rad wolf. This is Party God from Adventure Time. Uh, it's a pretty good show that I recommend you watch. So let's say we want to do uh, some layout kind of like this with Party God. On the phones, or the phone and the tablet, Party God's all shrunk up in the corner and you can't really see his awesome might. So we want to do art direction where we crop something like this so you can actually see what's going on in the image. And we can do that with responsive images too. So there's your normal image. And once again, it's a child of the picture element. And once again, we have source elements. But this time, instead of a type attribute, we have a media attribute. And we can put in our media conditions here the same way we did uh, before in source set, or sorry, in sizes, and the same way we have it in our CSS. And now tell the browser, if there's a minimum width of 1,000 pics, you have to display wolf crop big. If there's a minimum width of 600 pics, you have to display wolf crop small. And if neither of those conditions are met, you can fall back and show just wolf.jpg. And again, source elements like this are an imperative to the browser. It has no option. It has to display these. So you're going to be guaranteed that your art direction always looks exactly the way you want it, no matter what, uh, assuming the browser supports responsive images. And that's it. That's actually everything. For the simple use cases, it's everything. Uh, you can actually combine these things, and it gets a little crazy. It gets a little hairy. So I'm going to show you this. Don't freak out. This is why responsive images kind of got a bad rap for a while. <laughs> this is all to display one image on screen. It's combining all the stuff I just talked about. And it's insane. It's, it's like horrible, and nobody wants to do this to display one image. It's a bunch of garbage. But the nice thing is, if you ever get into a weird situation, some edge case where you need this kind of flexibility, you can do this and combine all those things in those, that way. It doesn't mean this is going to be what you do every day. It's going to be that one-off crappy day at work when you had to write 800 lines to display one image. <laughs> But you can do it if you need to. This is what you're going to do 95, 90% of the time, uh, which is use sizes and source set with a W descriptor. Just throw a bunch of image files at the browser, tell it how big they are, tell it how big the image should display, and let it figure it out for you. And if you only have two sizes, cool. Just throw two files in there, let the browser figure it out. If you happen to have you know, 15 different sizes of the same thing, great. Let the browser deal with it. And you're going to get a good experience for everybody. So again, that's the link to the specification. Uh, it's pretty readable as far as specifications go, but it's still a spec. So you know, uh, it's interesting to read. I recommend checking it out, but it might be a bit dense. I covered like some basic use cases, but as with anything on the web, there can be like really weird, crazy, scary edge cases. And uh, Taylor Hunt actually wrote an article about this where you're getting into some more advanced stuff. So he looked at weird things like animated GIFs being displayed on e-ink displays, so you have to worry about the refresh rate being kind of wonky and not understanding the animation, and just how to deal with like bizarre problems like that. So the kind of thing that, you know, there's probably not going to be a lot of tutorials about. He's, he's got you covered. So if you're getting into advanced stuff, I recommend checking this out. And you can use this stuff now. That's the cool thing. I've given this talk a bunch of times, and most of the time it's like, well, maybe it'll come eventually. I don't know. But it's here now, almost everywhere. Uh, you can use all this stuff in Firefox, Chrome, Opera, and even Edge. And you can use source set in sizes uh, in Safari 9 and iOS 9. And Safari's almost there with picture. Uh, just two days ago, it landed in WebKit. 
So hopefully by the next Safari release, it'll be in, in there as well. If you want to support, uh, do this stuff with browsers that don't support it yet, or like older browsers, there's a polyfill out there called Picture Fill. Uh, it's by Scott Gell at the Filament Group and others from the Filament Group. And you know how open source stuff is, everybody contributed. So yeah, that's there, it's really good. It uses the exact same spec, or sorry, the exact same markup as the spec. So if you wanna use it for now and then pull picture fill later, you won't have to like update all your pages, it'll just magically work. Um, but if you're not sure if it's for you, he also wrote an article called to picture fill or not to picture fill, which goes over some of the pros and cons of if this polyfill is right for you. Personally, I think we're at a good enough point now where we can just ditch the polyfill and rely on the built-in fallback, but you might have different needs for your projects and customers. So uh, that's good. Responsive images are awesome, but also they're kind of a pain. Um, if we're serving, say, 15 different image sizes for each image we want to display on the page, then that means we have to actually like export all these images and deal with this as part of our process. This is a tweet from Tessa Thornton, who at the time I did not work with, but now is a coworker of mine. Um, and I feel her pain, like this is a really crappy part about responsive images. So I went ahead and built this for you. This is grunt resp image. It's a grunt task. I'm sorry I don't have a gulp task, but I'm open to forks and PRs. Um, and it'll, you can just throw a big image at it and give it some output sizes. It'll do some resizing for you with really smart defaults. Um, basically, it's going to output visual quality that's identical to Photoshop, but at way smaller file sizes. It can also rasterize SVG to ping so that you can have a ping fallback for any SVG images. It can rasterize PDFs so you can create thumbnails of PDFs and it can run it through any uh, or three different external image optimizers. I also built a PHP version which doesn't have quite as many features but it still does the smart resizing and saving to different sizes. You can integrate this into your CMS or whatever. Uh, I did not write this, some other person wrote this, and this actually generates the markup for you. So if you just have a normal image element, it will build out all that markup so you don't even have to deal, which is nice. And finally, this is an article I wrote uh, for Smashing Magazine that talks about the research that went into this about how it actually shrinks the stuff down so it's good quality but still super tiny file sizes. Uh, but it makes some recommendations if you're using image magic about how to automate resizing. So maybe you want to do that server side, you don't want to use these plugins, maybe you already have a flow. It's worth checking out uh, what some of the settings are in image magic that you can make use of. So that's more or less it for performance for responsive images. But in the title, I also said I wanted to talk about responsible images. And responsive images are definitely part of that. Uh, but there's some other things that we can do too to be responsible about our image use. One is image optimization, which I just touched on. Uh, image optimizers are basically just tools that you put an image into and it will losslessly compress it. It'll put, spit out an image that looks exactly the same but is magically smaller. There's basically no reason not to do this. Um, yeah, that's it. No but. There's no reason not to do this. So here's some tools that you can use. Um, image Optim and Image Optim are not the same tool, which is frustrating. So Image Optim with a big I and a big O is a GUI for the Mac. Um, image Optim with small letters and an underscore is a command line tool. Uh, SVGO GUI is a GUI to compress SVGs and SVGO is a command line tool. All of these will not hurt your image quality at all. They will just make your images smaller at no cost to you. If you're serving SVGs, you can add something like this into your Apache config if you are running on Apache. Uh, basically, you want to serve your SVGs gzipped. Uh, again, it's not going to hurt anything. It's not going to ruin the quality or anything like that. It just magically makes it faster. So always serve your SVGs gzipped. And if you're not running Apache, you can still do this on whatever you're using. It just won't look exactly like that. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is deferred image loading or lazy loading. So this is eBay, uh, or this is 
eBay above the fold on my laptop. There's a lot of images on here, but that's to be expected uh, for a site like this. This is the whole page. Um, probably that's hard for you to see, but it's really long and there's a ton of images. And so if all of those were loaded up front by the preloader, it would take a long time for the page to load, it would be a huge bandwidth hit, and it would be a bad experience for the users. So what eBay does and what a lot of other sites do is this thing called lazy loading, where it'll only load the stuff below here once you scroll and once it gets into view. And I'm sure you've seen this on sites where like an image will just kind of fade in or something. And that's lazy loading, where JavaScript is loading it after the fact, so that if the user never scrolls down, which is uh, most of the time, because they're probably just going to enter a search or hit one of the calls to action, they don't have to worry about downloading all this crap. Uh, this is a lazy loading script. You can just Google like lazy loading images, and there'll be a million solutions, solutions out there. This one works with all the responsive images uh, markup, which is really nice. It's by a guy named Alexander Farkas, who has contributed a lot to picture fill and other responsive image stuff. Uh, so I highly recommend this one. The next thing, and actually the last performance one, is CDNs and caching. So. I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but if you have access to a CDN, use it. It's going to make things faster and help with caching. Um, if you have the ability to uh, do per file caching um, settings or play with your caching at all, take a look at what makes sense for your site and your users. Your logo is probably not changing all that often, so you can set a really long expires on that cache. There's probably other elements that are relatively static that you don't have to have refreshed very often. So the next couple things I'm going to talk about are accessibility, because accessibility is important to me. If you're updating your images anyway, it's a good time to take a look at the accessibility of them. And you gave me a platform, so whatever, I'm going to talk about it. Um, so the first one is appropriate contrast and color. If you have low vision, oh man, OK, so this is actually great. Um, <laughs> It doesn't look this bad on screen, but this is a really good example of why good contrast is important. If you're projecting an image, you can't really rely on the contrast. You want to have to, or you want to make sure there's really great contrast in order for it to make sense. If your user has low vision or if they're colorblind, contrast is also going to be important whether it's projected or not. So something like this might be a little bit better. It's still not ideal, but it's a hell of a lot better than this and it's more readable. Now, the problem with this, though, is it's not going to be super good for somebody that's colorblind. Uh, I happen to be colorblind, and I can tell you that although generally I can distinguish between the wedges, there's no way I can match the wedges up with what's in the legend at the top. I have no idea what each number or what month each number represents. Um, so I'm going to do a little experiment. There's a tool that I use to convert this into what it looks like for me. And that's what I have on the next slide. So the next slide looks identical to this slide for me. I'm going to have to like, trust other people that it's actually different. <laughs> uh, but I'll switch, and you can tell me if you think it looks any different. Same, different? OK, that's a more wishy-washy answer than I expected. So we'll blame that on the projector. Uh, but the point is. This is something you should worry about. Uh, this is the tool I used. It's called Color Oracle. And you can, uh, it's for Windows, Mac, and Linux. It just puts a little thing in your menu bar that lets you simulate different types of color blindness. So you can check all your images to make sure they make sense uh, for all your users. So something like this is a step in the right direction. Uh, it's kind of ugly, but the wedges are pretty distinct for. Uh, a low contrast situation like this projector for somebody with low vision, for somebody with color blindness, and more importantly, even if somebody can't distinguish uh, that, like that one wedge is yellow, the labels are now right next to each wedge, so it doesn't matter what color each one is. I can still get the information that I need just by looking at the placement of the labels. I don't have to do any of the matching that I had to do with this one, which is a huge relief. Uh, the next accessibility-based thing is having a text-based alternative for all your content images. 
There's a lot of ways to do this. Hopefully most of you are used to using alt text, the alt attribute on your image. You can also use aria described by and aria labeled by, uh, which can provide some additional information. There's the long desk attribute, which is highly controversial, but it exists. Uh, you can read up on it, but most people I think are saying not to use it, but it's there. Uh, you can wrap your image in a link and link to a longer description, a longer format description. You can use a fig caption, or if it's an SVG, there's title elements within SVG and text elements within SVG that make it accessible that you can expose as well. Um, don't worry about writing all these down because I posted the slides, but there's a bunch of information here about how to use uh, alternate text appropriately for your images. And the last thing is just to use fewer images overall. Uh, it, if you don't have an image, things are going to load faster. Cut it out, use CSS, use, um, I don't know, text or like design or layout. Figure out a way to do something cool that doesn't involve downloading that eight megabyte photo and it's going to be a faster experience. Now obviously you're not going to remove every single image, but if you think about it in the design process and keep this in mind, it can be, uh, it can help your users in the long run and hopefully help you and your business in the long run. Uh, so the last thing I want to leave you with is this quote from Brad Frost that I had at the beginning, good performance is good design. Let's all think about performance in the design process. And finally, if you want to come work at Shopify, we're always hiring smart devs. So uh, that's the website or you can come talk to me. That's my Twitter and GitHub and the slide URL again. Thanks.